Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing. We hope you had a great Thanksgiving holiday, and I know now begins the countdown to the winter break, so hang in there. It's not very far away, and we've got a great webinar session planned for you today uh, to kind of help you along in your countdown to the winter break. Uh, we'll get started right at 3 o'clock Eastern time. As you are logging in today, just a quick reminder, the control bar is on the bottom of your web browser window. The chat area is where we will be looking for lots of interaction and conversation with you today. Please make sure that from the drop down in the chat area, you have selected everyone. Because when you chat, we want everyone who is on with us today to be able to see what you have to say. Uh, so and it's easy to miss. So go in there and select everyone. And that way uh, everyone will be able to see what you have to say. There's also a Q&A area, and that is where you can put your questions either for Saddleback or for our panelists today. And if you would like to take advantage of subtitles, you'll need to select live transcript and then click show subtitle. We have a panel of educators with us today to talk about a very important topic, which is differentiation. Uh, they're all on Twitter. So this is where you can find them. We encourage you to go to Twitter, um, let us know uh, what you think and continue start and continue the conversation uh, on Twitter about this topic today. Uh, we're all very active on Twitter and we'd love to hear your feedback. So we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. I'll leave this up here for just uh, another minute or so, but while we're waiting, we are very interested in knowing who's here right now. So if you could go to the chat and let us know uh, what you teach, uh, what your position is and where you're joining us from. Uh, it's very important that we know uh, who is here so we can tailor our conversation accordingly. And while you're doing that, this is who's here besides little old me. Okay, we've got Sarah Guidry, who is from Louisville ISD. She's a secondary ESL specialist. Holly Genova, also from Louisville ISD in Texas. She's an ESL advocate. And of course, Jody Nall, return Saddleback webinar presenter. She's an ESL coordinator in Palm Beach County Schools in Florida. So that's who we are. Uh, who's here? Let's see. Let me go to the chat. We've got. Hi, Yvonne. How are you? Stacy. Okay, so we've got um, a math teacher and instructional coach. Uh, I'm glad, Yvonne. Very nice. Uh, Amy. Okay, we've got K to eight MLL teacher. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm interested in the balance of who is specifically an uh, EL teacher versus who's a content area teacher in high school or middle school looking for information. So that, that would be helpful to know. Thank you for that, Stacy. Okay, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. This is, uh, I know, uh, it's in the middle of the workday for a lot of you, so we appreciate you taking the time to be here. Hi, Catherine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, eighth grade English teacher, so it looks like we've got our... Um, Perhaps content area teacher here, not an ESL teacher specifically. Hi, Carly. Hi, Robert. Welcome back. Haven't seen you in a while. Glad you could join us. Excellent, Kathy. Our elementary and high school students. Wonderful. Thank you. Keep populating this information. We're all we're keeping an eye on it just so we know uh, who is here so we can make sure that our conversation is relevant for you today. Thank you so much. All right, it's just about that time. So this is our topic for today. We wanna to talk about differentiation for multilingual learners, specifically in secondary classrooms. Now this webinar is going to have a little bit of a different look and feel because this is a panel discussion. Uh, so we want this to be more of a, an open conversation so that we can share our knowledge and our thoughts and uh, give you um, some good information and some good strategies when you're thinking about how you can differentiate for your students. Um, so we have a great panel for you. Uh, and Jody is going to actually get us started in just a minute. But first, I would like to start off with a poll. I'm going to launch a poll. We want uh, some information from you. So here is our poll. It should be popping up on your screen right now. When you think about differentiation, what is your biggest challenge? Is it you don't have enough time? Is it just the knowledge? I, I don't know how to do this. Is it the materials? You don't know what to use. You don't have the stuff that you need to do it. Or is it support? You just don't have anyone to help you figure this all out. 
So we'll leave this open um, for as long as it takes to get a good response. We're at about 30% right now. So keep those answers coming in. Looks like time right now is um, probably the most popular answer, but we'll give it a few more seconds. All right, we'll get this up to 60% response. Look at this. I think it's pretty clear uh, that time, I guess having the time to figure this all out is, uh, is a pretty big challenge. Okay. All right, thank you so much for your participation in the poll. Let's share the results here. So it looks like we have 56% of you say, this, I just don't have enough time. And it's either, I, I'm assuming it's time to just figure this all out and sort of decode the situation and, uh, and, and plan and learn for uh, best practices. So uh, thank you for your participation in that. And I think this is uh, going to be a great session because we're going to give you uh, some great information to help give you some direction uh, for differentiation. Um, Ladies, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I think if you're all still on, on mute, you can unmute. I'm gonna stop sharing here because we are going to do this, as I said, more of as a, as a discussion. Um, Jody is going to get us started. You are um, an ESOL coordinator in Palm Beach. So um, we're all going to have sort of a different focus and different angle that we take as we talk about differentiation, but you'll see that they're also related. Uh, so Jody, what, what are you going to start us off with today? Uh, first of all, thank you everyone so much for coming. You know, I really, really enjoy doing these. I'm so excited. And what I am going to talk about today is I'm going to start with the logistics and mainly the, let me get my slideshow started. It's how I can structure the layout of my secondary classroom. Now, even though I'm an ESOL coordinator, just so all of you know, I am a former content area teacher. I'm a former high school and middle school classroom teacher, not an EL teacher specifically. I had ELs in my mainstream classroom, as many of you do. And so what I noticed was there were many things to consider when you're structuring for example, for support coming in, if you have support facilitation for your, for your ESE students, if you have, in my school, we have a collaborative EL model where we have push-in. We really don't believe in pulling out in Palm Beach County. We'll, we believe in inclusiveness. So there are some considerations. We need to think about space. And especially in the age of COVID, how do we create space if we need to social distance? We need to think about the furniture. Um, many of us do not have the luxury of those beautiful pieces of furniture that you might find in elementary classrooms, which, by the way, in my experience and in my area, those elementary classrooms tend to be bigger. They're made for co-teaching environments. They're made for, for example, shared um, teaching. But in elementary, I'm mean, sorry, in secondary, as you know, we tend to be pretty solitary, right? And our classrooms were not really made for two teachers in a room, we're a support teacher. And so we need to think about those things. And in secondary, we don't have, for example, 25 students to think about. Many of us have 25 students, 125 students to think about, 25 students per class. So we really need to think about this differently. And so uh, what I'm going to show you today are some things that might work for the nature of that secondary classroom, especially if you have a co-teaching model, if you have a push-in model, it's how am I going to actually plan in this classroom? So let's look at a couple of options. Let's look at the space. So here we have a picture. And by the way, these are actual classrooms in my school. They are nothing fancy. It's a bit of an older building. So we do not have this state of the art, technology and state-of-the-art um, furniture. We just have the basics like many of you have. And also, just as a side note, we do not do any hybrid. We are fully in school on campus in, um, in Palm Beach County in the state of Florida. So here we have some tables um, that are divided, by the way, in triads. You could also do pairs. 
this particular teacher um, was given all of these tables and that really works for her. And you might be thinking, yeah, I, I don't get all that. I, I get a bunch of desks and that's what I have to go with. But I'm going to show you ways that you can work with those desks as well, because actually that's what I had. I did not have tables like this. Notice also that they are spaced apart and there is space down the middle for a good flow. One of those tables can be used for your collaborative teacher, your push-in teacher, your support facilitation teacher. One of those tables can be offset a little bit to be able to facilitate two teachers at once. Also, if you look way in the back, you will see the small group table that I'm going to show you in just a moment. So here we have a horseshoe table. These are at a premium in my school. They're very rare and very hard to find. But what I want to show you is that these are now um, in small groups of three. Before COVID, we tended to have groups of four or five, depending upon um, the number in a group. Sometimes we actually would put six around a table. We no longer do that. And so you might think, well, how am I supposed to do that with social distancing? If I can't have my group of six, what am I going to do? You just break that six into two groups of three or perhaps three groups of two. We're going to discuss later how to actually group them. But this is how you can lay out your classroom to accommodate that social distancing if you need to do that. You might say to yourself, I don't have a horseshoe table. I don't have those kind of luxuries. I get a teacher desk or I have 25 student desks. How am I going to work with that? Well, I'm gonna show you how you can do that because that was my classroom. So let's look at some furniture options. Here we have another classroom. This teacher, um, I found it very interesting and hers are grouped by fours. She has all of the, de the desks. Notice that they are spaced apart. Again, this is a traditional standard classroom size. This is not an oversized room. This is a regular sized classroom. Notice that she has one desk and I asked her about it. And you might be thinking, oh, is that, is that for a student who just can't work in a group? I want you to think of this very, very differently. We have in this classroom, individual desks alone. We have pairs when we need to, and we have triads, et cetera. Sometimes she works in fours. And I asked her about this particular desk. It was very interesting. We, in my school, we, we both share a student who is recently labeled ESE. He is a lower level speaker as well. So he overlaps. He is ESE and he is EL. And she found through gathering data, which we are also going to talk about in a little bit, through really knowing her student, she said, you know, he actually works better and is more confident when he is just a little bit on his own. Notice that he is still in view of all his classmates. He is by no means separated. This is by no means a punishment. He actually performs better when he is able to have a little bit of space. This also allows the teacher to work a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with him because she is able to get in close proximity of him and him alone. And so don't look at single desks as, um, as a detriment to your planning. Think of it as an asset or a benefit because you also have the flexibility of the pairing, triads, groups of four, now, when I was in the classroom, what I would do is I would have two sets of pairs next to each other or two groups of three offset a little bit. Now, we talked about time. Time was a big factor that everyone said, you know, I, just, I don't have enough time to do this. Here's what I did in the classroom because come on, let's face it. We have five minutes in between classes to get your stuff done, get the kids out, get the new kids in your class, get the next class going and so on and so forth. So what I would do about two minutes before class ended, because I really did not want to burn up class time. So these two um, groups of two, what the students would do is about two minutes before class ended, they would actually turn them to face each other and push them together. And then I had my four. And then when my next class came in where I said, you know what, I'm not doing groups with them today. They're doing fours. Same thing. They would pull apart turn them to face this way and they were back in their pairs. And it literally took about two minutes a piece for each time you do that. 
So don't look at your individual desks as, well, you know, this is secondary. We don't have those luxurious big tables that elementary school kids can work at. You can make this work for you very, very well. So as far as creating space, you know, we have a lot of students, right? I mean, come on, I had 125, 115, 16. I mean, we're talking a lot of kids coming through my classroom. And so we do our bins and shelves and organization of materials for multiple classes. In this particular classroom, we have the turn-in bins and the out bins and what all of our teachers traditionally have, but also we have their individual journal journals kept in the classroom on a lower shelf. And so that made the students more independent, but also they are arranged along the perimeter of the room, creating a very nice flow in that secondary classroom. So if you don't have as much space, try to utilize the space around the room so that you have nice amount of social distancing among your groups and among your pairs. And that way you also have a very nice flow for both teachers to be able to work together. Or if that one, to, if you as the content teacher are doing that small group pullout, you can go to a separate table as your pullout table. And the teacher at the individual desks, what she does is she groups her kids according to their group desks so that when she needs to do pullout or small group, I should say, not pullout, that was the wrong term, but when she pulls them for small group, she can either go to their group because they're already together or she will move them into another small group area and they're already grouped. She doesn't have to um, concern herself with grouping right there in that moment. And it creates a little bit of a less likelihood of a lot of, um, honestly, with, with us not being in masks in the state of Florida, we do not, they're optional. The kids are less likely to have so much interaction because they tend to stay in that group for that class period as they move around the room. And so there are many ways that you can do this. And we're also going to discuss how you get your groups together in the first place, because that's also another very important part of today's webinar. Jody, I wanted to jump in here uh, because we deliberately started with this idea of arranging the space. I think a lot of times when we talk about the challenges of differentiation, maybe our minds immediately go to the content and differenti differentiating the content and the lesson and the activities. Um, but it, it does start with some pretty um, deliberate planning, both in how, how you're going to utilize your space and how you're going to intentionally um, partner the students. So that's why we started there. And I love, love, love your uh, pictures. I think it's uh, really great to have um, the, the pictures to sort of illustrate your points. But what I'm wondering is for those of you who are uh, with us live and in the chat who teach middle school and high school, um, whether you are in some sort of a pull-up program or whether you're a content area teacher using a collaborative model, um, how does this resonate with you? What are, what are your spaces like? Uh, are you um, in quads? Are you in triads? Are you um, in rows of desks and you can't quite figure out how to make it work? Um, we wanna keep the, the conversation going uh, and, and kind of hear what you have to say uh, as we are uh, going throughout our conversation today. So uh, while you're thinking about that and typing in the chat, uh, I think we can sort of build on what Jody has just discussed, which is the, the arranging the space. And then once you have um, that sort of settled in your mind and you think about utilizing the space and where the students are going to fit into that space, there's another line of thought that we need to tackle. And that's how, how are the students going to be grouped together? And that's where Sarah is going to take us. Thank you, Sue. Sue says she has individual desks so students can work independently and elbow partners in a team of four. Thank you. Keep that coming. I'll be checking in on, on those uh, responses. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Liz, and thank you, Jody. And I, I think that's so important to, to make sure your classroom is as flexible as you can make it so that you can meet the needs of your students. Um, we know that, that using student groups is a great way to differentiate, um, to allow students the opportunities to work with a partner or to work with a small group, um, to pull them into a small group for different instruction. Um, to work together on, on different projects. It's, um, 
it's really hard to differentiate with a solid whole class model all the time. Um, and grouping students can be a little intimidating, but um, getting to know your students and, and giving them opportunities to know each other is really important. It's time well spent. Um, it's preparation that we all need. And I, uh, I also was in a middle school at, and taught um, content courses. I taught science and social studies as well as ELAR and um, ESL. Um, so it, I, I know some of those struggles of having a lot of students, um, but just getting to know them, having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, I, I made it a point to try to, to have a real conversation with each of my students at least once every two weeks. Um, once every week, if I could swing it, um, but at least once every two weeks to know what they like and what's going on in their lives and um, how they're getting along with others. And, and it, and it um, is beneficial in so many ways um, because once, once they know you and they know you care, right? They're, they're going to listen to the instruction uh, more as well as, um, as well as paying attention uh, to each other and what's going on in class. Um, for our English learners specifically, they need to talk, they need to have real conversations with each other and adults. I've given you here some simple conversation activities that give you opportunities to learn about your students and for them to learn about each other um, using some simple sentence stems. Uh, doing some activities like agreeing and disagreeing with a, with a question or a prompt and showing their agreement or disagreement by moving to different sides of the room. Um, using the four corners of your classroom. Again, um, our English learners, especially our new students that are just emerging in language, um, they, can, they can move themselves easier than they can reply with, with a question and you're still learning about what they like, what they dislike, if they agree, if they disagree. Um, I love find someone who, um, find someone who knows the answer to this. Find someone who has the same this as you. Um, it can be a variety of things and it can be a quick uh, warm up. It doesn't have to be a long uh, drawn out activity. Um, it, recently, I saw some students doing a selfie and share. It was find a partner, take a selfie with, that, with them, with your iPad. Our, our district is, is blessed with iPads. So take a selfie with your iPad, share it with the group in the discussion board with a tag um, using a sentence stem. We both um, and, and a similarity. Um, so you're learning about your students in some of these activities. As you learn about your students, keep notes and keep them in a useful way. So this is, this is something that worked for me. It may work for you. Um, we're sharing uh, these templates with you if you'd like to use them. Um, but as I met with students, I often, um, once after I talked to them, I, I would use a little form. And um, as I interviewed a student the first time they enrolled in my class, the first five minutes I had with them, I would either go back, I would either do it with them right there, or I'd go back to my seat and just take quick notes. The students in my second period class, they're 14 years old. They also speak another language or not. Um, if I knew their language proficiency, great. If I found it later, I'd add it in. Their gender, um, any accessibility considerations that I already know about the student. Um, oh, I will change the share settings. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, uh, we'll make sure that you have access to the form. Um, their motivation, uh, their reading level, if you know it, and then any talents or interests that at, like one kid comes in, he's playing soccer every day. Like that is his obsession. I wouldn't make a note of that because when I find a book about soccer or if I know another kid that's involved in soccer and they're gonna get along well because they have similar interests, like that's important. Um, that form goes right into my spreadsheet and this is all fictional information, um, but, it, but it's based on years of, of learning about students. Um, so this is just a, a fictional class that I put together in my second period, the variety of ages, because sometimes it's important. You don't want a, a really older student with a really younger student necessarily. It's something to keep in, in mind. Their language proficiency, their gender. I always, get, I always um, placed on my seating chart, I always placed my boys first. I always seem to have a lot of boys and I typically place them first. Um, it, it just worked better that way. 
for me. Um, but uh, this, it's easy to um, filter and sort. So if I want to just look at them first, I can do that. And I'm going to go over um, one piece of data I always added to my spreadsheet after I created it was um, their pre-assessment data. So we're moving into the next unit. How, how are they doing? Um, who's strong in this area? Who's weak in this area? As I, as I um, group them for uh, being able to help each other on the coming lessons, I wanna make sure that my strongest student in this area is sitting next to someone that can use their help not my weakest student though, because there's gonna be a frustration um, if you see the strongest student with the weakest student. If the, if the gap is too far, they're not, they're not as likely to be able to help each other. Um, maybe I wanna look and see if I've got um, it, males that also speak the same language and I've got their languages in here so I could sort um, by languages and say, okay, I want to look and see if I have students that can help each other. Um, and look, I have three of them. Maybe I want to seat them together for this coming activity. Keep your grouping uh, configurations flexible. Uh, here's a list of ideas for those, for those forms for you. Of course, that's not extensive. Um, again, we talked about filtering and sorting. Um, that that worked for me in a spreadsheet. Um, I've seen I've seen teachers use sticky notes with it. You know, um, just keep or note cards. Um, any way you can do it, where you can organize students and know things about them and be intentional, because that intentionality in advance saves you time in the long run. Um, because when students work effectively together, when they find something in common with each other, when they can support each other well. Uh, your class time is going to be so much more effective. Here's another example using Google Slides to, um, to map out those seating charts. And um, so I would use my spreadsheet to just do, this is table one, seat three, is table two, seat four. I hope you can see that. So if I want a mixed table group or a, a mixed seating arrangement or their language table, um, and then I would go over to Google Slides and just pull their names over. Um, and so that was a mixed arrangement, like with skill level, mixed skill level arrangement. So they can support each other in that diverse seating arrangement. Um, when you do have a, a heterogeneous or a mixed grouping, these are some of your benefits. Um, you have a built-in partner to support. Um, it's a great, option for when you're in a we do, right, a practice activity. Um, it, it provides, it provides uh, support within the team and different, uh, different ideas, different strengths that students can build upon. Again, uh, you never want your highest student in that area with your lowest student in that skill level area. Um, the the shoulder partner or the face partner needs to be someone that they can work with. I, I often did groups of four, but groups of partners and groups of three uh, work really well in these arrangements as well. Sometimes you want groups that are more homogenous, um, skill level groups, like I want my students that are struggling the most with this group together so that I can work with them intensively. And I want my students that have really shown they've they already have the skill to be able to be together and to move on into something else. Um, so there are some reasons you may want, maybe I want all of my students that are in band together because they're all gonna be absent for the rest of the week. And I know I'm gonna have to catch them up. So I'm gonna regroup for this week because I know the schedules are gonna be weird and uh, that band group is gonna miss uh, the whole lesson. Um, so th thinking ahead about some of those things and grouping your students accordingly is really helpful here. Uh, so there's, that's a just a homogenous arrangement. I loved having the individual seats um, because they are flexible in that I can pull a desk over and make a group of five. I can pull a student over that needs to be by themselves and works best by themselves. Um, but knowing your students and how they work best is is the game changer, of course. 
Uh, this was a little uh, form that I that I would kind of remind myself of and that you might find useful. What are we doing? And how do my students need to work? Am I introducing a new skill? Do I want to do that as a whole group? Do I want to do it in small groups? Do I want a student with a partner for different activities during that introduction? Um, or do they need to do it independently? Of course, when they're assessed, maybe they need to be independent so that I know what they can do. Um, but maybe this group needs a partner so that they can help each other translate. And I can and I can observe that too and 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 know. So that's a, just a chart for thinking. I just I want to thank you all for we've got some great ideas. We've got lots of, of great people on this call that have great ideas. So uh, that's what I have to uh, to share as far as grouping and um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I want to actually go back and revisit the the chat. I didn't want to interrupt you because mm -hmm. people were really really. Um, excited and interested in your content, but um, the the two ideas are, are coming together between the furniture and the intentional grouping. And there are some questions that are arising um, specifically around some obstacles around arrangement. Um, we, you may have seen ladies, some comments that popped up in the chat about, um, uh, Charlene had a, a comment about, well, to do that, maybe the, two students out of the four in a quad would have to have their backs to the board. So that could pose a, a challenge. So are the quads like temporary? Is it like a permanent fixture or is it a sometimes thing? So that's one comment that we can address. And then the other one uh, would be around how quickly do students grasp this concept of like moving the desks for you, like how much practice uh, before they were able to do it efficiently and quietly so as to not disturb other classes nearby or really take, you don't want that activity sort of eating into the lesson time, right? So um, what are your thoughts on that? I guess, Jody, we can start with you because you talked a lot about the furniture, but of course, let's all chime in here and keep it going in the chat if you have any other thoughts on this. What do you think, Jody? Uh um, I did notice that. I thought, first of all, I thought they were great questions. I thought they were very realistic questions because um, when they're in quads, yeah, you do have that, ah, now the person can't see the board. Now, when I did it, we, we all have smart boards in our classrooms, which that is a luxury that a lot of schools don't have. But regardless, we had, I did a lot with my screen. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I loved my document camera because I did a lot of writing as an ELA teacher. So the way I did the quads is if the screen is at the front, the kids actually sat this way, not this way. So they all were able to adjust their focus. So no one ever had their back. The other thing is I always circulated around. So if it was ever something that I needed to show, or as if you notice, I'm very, very animated when I talk, <laughs> I always wanted to make sure that number one, the children could hear me, um, which I is a little... <laughs> a little rare considering I, my voice projects, but regardless, you know, it, there is a lot of um, noise happening in a learning classroom. So I always made sure I circulated, especially if I had students with particular need. And as far as, um, you know, just making sure everyone could see, I always positioned things in a way to, to ensure that. That actually, I'm so glad you asked that question because that is something that I always was very, very conscious of. Because even though I'm only virtual, I'm very, very short. And I was always that student, I had to sit up front because I have to be able to see. So I completely understand that. And as far as the students being able to move the desks, that was never an issue. Because all I would direct them to do is to take them and turn them. And if, if there was ever a student who really didn't understand, all I had to do was take one oh, okay, so you want us to just put it next to it. So it was very, very, very simple. And because I did it so often, sometimes students would walk in and see the pairs and say, okay, this is what they need to look like when we're done with class because we need to move them, but we need to move them back. Or if they were in quads, same thing. They would walk in and say, oh, you know what? So-and-so from her third period said they're gonna be in pairs. So I already know that we're gonna have to turn them the way they were yesterday. I mean, I move them pretty much every day, if not every other day. And while it sounds very complicated, I mean, I taught five classes a day. It really, really wasn't because 
I had a group of 25 kids to help me all the time and they were only responsible for moving their desk. If some students found it a little difficult, they always had help. I usually had a few students who really just wanted to be helpers. I taught eighth, ninth, and 10th. I mean, I taught bigger kids, but they love to be helpers. It doesn't matter what age uh -huh. they are. They, they yeah. want to help. They want to contribute. They want to feel useful. And so sometimes I would say, you know what? I could really use your help and I really need for you to help me with this. And, oh, Miss Nolf, I'll do it for you. So while it does take a little practice, um, it, it became very, very easy. And as Sarah's grouping shows, groups, you know, groups of four, triads, pairs, that you have a lot of flexibility in that secondary classroom that you might not be aware of. I like the comment about the tennis balls too. We mm -hmm. see that a lot in um, the elementary classrooms, but it works with the older kids too. Uh, you can you can possibly get those donations of the tennis balls and use those to put onto the feet of the, the chairs or the desks. And that really cuts down on the noise if you're going to be moving your furniture around a lot and it protects I, the floors too, so. <laughs> I just gotta say really quickly, my building, we were actually built back in the day where you had the moving, the paneled uh, walls. Oh we yeah. don't use them anymore. But when someone mentioned noise, it resonated because my my school by nature has a lot of noise because we don't have very thick walls. They're just paneling. So, um, you know, it is an adjustment, but the kids take it in stride. Yeah, I, I loved using the tennis balls as well. Um, and I, I I'll tell you, Jody, I've had some classes that that were a little bit uh, difficult uh, behavior wise. Um, and for those classes, I had to set a timer and give them a re reward. I, I'd be like, if you guys get this done in 20 seconds, move the room, here you go, and set that timer, and then give them some kind of a, a back, whether it was, okay, you have a minute to talk to each other because you moved quickly and well, or um, a treat of some kind, you know, uh, anything uh, we can do to reward them. But, but setting it up at the beginning of, um, you know, and setting that expectation and practicing it regularly, um, it, they absolutely, they absolutely can do it. Um, I have sixth, seventh, eighth high school, um, they, they can move a desk, they can turn it. Um, and you can do groups of four and five where no one's back is to the wall. Um, and if somebody isn't sure how to do that, I'm happy to, to chat with them. Just like Jody said, you know, where, where two people are facing each other and others are facing, you know, different directions. I don't know how to show that on a webinar exactly, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, there, are lots, there are lots of grouping configurations to make sure that people do have vis visual access to the front of the room, but are also in groups uh, together um, and don't lose that access to, to see. It's a great questions. Yeah. And you could always ask for feedback from your students as well. You know, what is working for them as Sarah mentioned, you get to know your students, you just ask them, you know, and um, when you have that type of relationship, they will, they will answer you. And they'll say, you know, I, I really can't see. And I said, hey, I, I totally get it. We're going to see what we can do. Uh, thank you. Oh, hi, Carly. Carly says, yeah, student feedback is critical. And you're right. And Carly, we can't wait to have you on our webinar uh, series coming up again here in a few weeks. Uh, all right, but let's get back on track. Um, so we've talked about the logistics of the space. We've talked about um, specific um, strategies around making sure that our uh, groupings are deliberate and setting the expectation of things are going to shift in the classroom. Sometimes we may be in pairs, sometimes we might be working solo, sometimes we might be in a small group with a teacher. Um, so now what about um, the content? Like how do we, how do we differentiate the content, uh, especially for our brand new English learners? And how do we ensure that we are um, really viewing our students um, through an asset-based lens to ensure that we are leveraging their strengths. Um, and that's where Holly is going to take the conversation uh, at this point. So Holly, thank you for being here and thank can't wait to so hear what you have to say about, about this. Thank you for having me. I'm going to share, there we go. All right, so thank you guys so much for having me and thank you all for being here today. Um, <clears throat> So yes, I'm going to talk about how we can all participate all the time, all of our students, even our students that are not English speaking, and um, we're going to teach from like an asset-based um, stance when we talk about our students. <clears throat> so 
Um, I'm gonna be back on what everybody said is this importance of knowing our students. Donald Graves <clears throat> says that you need to know 10 things about someone before you can teach them. It seems like a lot, but it's not. And once you know those 10 things and <clears throat> you're able to know lots of little things about your students, they respond better to you in your teaching, 100%. Um, and they need to know a little bit about you too. So they'll start to know things about you as they share. Um, one idea that we really need to think about with our multilingual students is our mindset. And we have to move our mindset as teachers from ESL classes are remedial, right? To ESL classes are accelerating instruction and we have scaffolds for our students. Um, the idea that our ESL students can't speak English to our ESL students have all this language, literacy, and life experiences that we are going to build upon that is their assets that they are bringing to our learning community. Um, we're going to move this mindset of they don't understand to how do I, as the instructor, make my lesson comprehensible. And we're going to move to like, those are your students to those are our students. <clears throat> so some things that are gonna make our lessons successful overall when we're working with our multilingual learners are when you're talking, you wanna have those talking points on the board so they can see and hear the information at the same time. We're gonna wait for processing time, pause and clarify. <clears throat> for all of our assignments, we're gonna break them down into smaller steps and have lots of little moments to check in. Um, that's why when I was doing in my grouping, as students, I would have tables of four, desks of four grouped together, but I would only put three students at each group because I lacked one desk for me in every group. That or if it was like a really huge class, I would have multiple desks, not desk stools around the room where I could go and sit with each group. That gave me that opportunity to like check in with them. <clears throat> And we have to remember that our standards are always staying the same. We're just connecting and building upon our students' assets. Teaching with images and video help make those abstract ideas really concrete. Um, and this is a big idea, it's for another time, but just to put it out there is translanguaging, not translating. And what I mean by that is that we take advantage of our students' full linguistic repertoire. We build upon it. We build upon that L1. And we know that our infected instruction involves all of the language resources that our students bring to the table, all of those assets that they have. All right, <clears throat> this is some frames that we're gonna put in the chat for you later or right now um, that I've built out that you're more than welcome to use. And I'll talk about how to use them. Um, some structured reading, writing and speaking frames for our students so that they're, everyone is participating in our lessons and our content. <clears throat> Um, this is just an example of some multilingual notes. This is built out for world geography. Um, the students are gonna <clears throat> read first. I don't know if you guys have ever used Wonderopolis. It's fantastic. You can switch your languages in it. Love it. Um, or read what they have in class, their teacher notes. Um, <clears throat> take notes in their language first. The next step is they're gonna pull out the important vocabulary that they need, anybody would need to know in English to understand that lesson. And then they're gonna synthesize their learning and share with a partner in English something that they learn and why it's important that they're learning that. So just an example, this is from a student who um, had interactive formal education or um, little to no formal education. <clears throat> We were discussing um, the topic of refugees um, and reading a class novel. And I wanted to make sure that he really understand the book that we were gonna be reading together inside out and back again. And so I wanted him to read first um, about refugees. And so found an article on Wonderopolis about refugees. And so he read the article first in his language. Great, has some understanding, but he was able to listen to it as well. So that was another aspect be able to listen to it in his language <clears throat> and, or, and or read. He took some notes in his language. So he switched because he was from Hakka Chin, which is within um, the country of Burma or Myanmar. So he read or listened in Burmese and then he switched to his spoken language of Hakka. I do not read, understand, 
anything with Burmese or Hakka at all. He could have been saying, who knows what about me or anybody else in the class, I don't know. But what I do know, <clears throat> based on his vocabulary that he put down that was important, is he understood. He understood the topic of refugees. Move a new country <clears throat> based on nationality, religion, or opinion. It might be voluntary, it might not. It, they're displaced <clears throat> and there's persecution involved. So based on that, I knew that he understood the topic. That, so that's what I'm looking at when I'm grading is if he, there's understanding there. So how could I use this if I'm in the content area? If I'm an algebra teacher in high school, right? I'm gonna do my lesson, my algebra lesson in English and they're gonna have their notes that they're taking. I'm gonna stop after I've done my lesson um, and introduce this new topic. My students are grouped together intentionally in pairs with someone that speaks their language. It might be someone that speaks their language and they have the um, similar skill base in algebra, or I might put where one person is bringing the next person up. It depends on what I'm doing, my intentionality, but definitely somebody with their language. So they're going to be listening in English, working on that listening skill, and they're going to turn it around and put notes in their language together. They're going to collaborate to create five notes based off of my notes in English there. Then their next step <clears throat> is what vocabulary is necessary to understand this lesson? What English vocabulary? They're going to put that down. So anybody from whatever language, whether it be English, Spanish, Chin, any language, what language, what words in English do I need to know to understand this lesson? What operations are necessary for this lesson? <clears throat> and then what symbols are for those operations? So they're getting lots and lots of content vocabulary built in there. They're gonna synthesize next. They're gonna share what they already knew, something new that they learned and why it's important they learn that skill. We're gonna have an example problem that they've worked out together. And then they're gonna write the steps for solving that problem in English. This part right here, the example problem and writing the steps, I'm gonna model. I'm gonna do that as an instructor. So we're gonna have our example problem, we're gonna solve it together. And then together as a class, we're gonna write the steps together for solving that in English. <clears throat> so that's how I would use it in content. And then last but not least, when you are working with students that are beginner or not English speaking or actually any level, it works at all levels across the board, um, be flexible and be empathetic with yourself <clears throat> and with your students. Um, if your multilingual learner needs some special support, be open to that and their unique needs. And then also um, remember, like it's not poor Brasito, it's not poor baby. Like we have to, as an instructor, have high expectations and <clears throat> be willing to understand the circumstances so that we can help. Um, so I'm on backtrack, just one thing I wanted to share. And I don't know if this is a question, but it's something that I thought of myself. So if I'm intentionally grouping my students together right here that speak the same language or have the same skill, what do I do if I have somebody that has one language in that classroom? What am I gonna do? Whose partner is that? They're my partner. They become my partner. And why do they become my partner? <clears throat> so they don't feel left out. They feel included. They get to feel a little special because they're my partner or I'm gonna intentionally sit them with someone who has higher language skills and sit them with that person who's also really friendly and nice and willing to help. So that's another part of willing, really knowing your students and who they are. Because it might be somebody that has really high language skills, but they have social anxiety and they don't wanna talk. <laughs> that's not their thing, they don't wanna help. So you have to know them. Um, so yeah. I love how this is all fitting together. Um, and Holly, I like how you went back and you tied in the, the grouping with, uh, with the frame. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is differentiation. We're, we're talking about arranging the room. We're talking about knowing your students so you can, in the most deliberate and strategic way possible, uh, pair them, partner them, group them in a way that um, really uses everybody's strengths 
uh, and, and really ho hopefully creates a low stress learning environment where everybody feels supported. And then of course you have uh, instructional tools like those that Holly shared with us uh, to facilitate um, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So um, I just love how all of these fit together. And this has been a, a great conversation. Um, let's go to some questions. I see the, the chat is starting to fire up here. Uh, what does Robert say? How do students, how do the students determine the vocabulary they need to understand the lesson? Do they note them down when the teacher models and goes over it uh, in the math example? Or uh, once identified, are they given time to define them for themselves? What role does the teacher play in that process when introducing the strategy for the first time? All right, Robert. So what I would do, I think is, <clears throat> and what I have done in the past is let students first figure out what they think is the key vocabulary, right? So that's the first step because we also want students to like own their learning right? And so when you own your learning, you're going to be picking things out. So they're owning their learning at that time. What vocabulary do they think is necessary? That's when I'm going to do like a quick, just like look around assessment and see like if everybody's picking out the vocabulary, I want them to. <laughs> and if they are, great. So we're moving on to the next thing. If they're not, then as the teacher, I'm going to take that time and I'm going to add in some additional things that they need to know. Right. Um, as for giving them time, of course, yes, I do want them to have that. And that could be in notes that like I've given them. It could be in anchor charts around the wall where they're going to find that. Right. And then that's why I'm working with making sure that they have not just what um, operation is necessary, but what are the different um, symbols for that operation are really important. So it's also building their content knowledge of knowing um, for example, like parentheses or the X are both symbols for multiply, right? So if you don't have that background knowledge, now I've, I've built it in intentionally within my lesson. And it's just kind of a little review for people that know it. And then for students that don't have that, have never seen that before or don't know that, um, I've introduced it for them new as well. Great answer and great question. Great questions, everybody, and mm -hmm. comments. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. So um, if before we wrap up, you have a thought or a question, go ahead to the chat while we're waiting to see if anybody else has any thoughts to share. Let me go ahead and let everybody know what is coming up next week, which is going to be our final webinar uh, for the fall. You don't, you don't want to miss this one. So we've got some... Um, heavy hitters in the world, uh, in the academic world of um, multilingual learners uh, and English learners. We have Debbie Zakarian, Margarita, uh, Margarita Espino Calderon and Margot Gottlieb joining us next week for a conversation around um, their new book, which is called Beyond Crises with Secondary Multilingual Learners. So um, we know that the ladies on this panel um, are, are it's like a, a who's who in, in the world of um, research around our multilingual learners, right? So they're going to join us to talk about what's hap what's going to, what now beyond the crisis? Now that the pandemic has really shown um, some of the uh, real strains and uh, inequalities, uh, especially for our students with multi, uh, for our multilingual learners, now what, right? So this is going to be a, a nice uh, conversation uh, to wrap up our winter uh, or our fall webinar series. And we really hope that you can join us. You can register on our website. Uh, you'll also be receiving um, an email to prompt you to register. And uh, we are very excited to see you there and to um, have this conversation. So let's see what else is going on in the chat. Um, Jennifer says, can you place the link into the chat? Um, which link would that be for the webinar registration or uh, let, let us know. Um, I was doing all these, but I didn't know these are differentiating. Yes, they are. Yes, absolutely. I love um, that comment because <laughs> differentiation is this big idea and it's kind of a scary word, but it's really just doing different things to meet the needs of the students in your class. You know, it, taking the content and breaking it into the parts to meet the needs of your students. And if you have these things in place, then, then you're ready to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think secondary teachers, sometimes we get to be afraid of, of doing different things with different, you know, groups of kids, but so many teachers are doing it. And, um, 
And that's great. That's great to hear. I'm glad we could affirm that for you today. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I think I can speak for everyone that um, our goal, or at least I know my goal for everything is that um, if we can, if you can leave something a little bit, something new that you're going to try and you feel affirmed in what you're already doing, then this was a great session. So I was going to say the same thing um, that coming from secondary, um, I, I was that teacher. I was hesitant. I have too many kids, not enough space, not sure how to group. And, and these were um, mostly English speakers. I did have ELs, but you know, I, I had my, my MLs, I had my 504s, I mm -hmm. had my ASD all in the same classroom. And it, it, it can be very overwhelming. And that's why we wanted to present to you today to say, number one, we've all been there. We totally, totally get it. And number two, to say there are shortcuts. There are ways to make it easier through spreadsheets to sort. Um, when Sarah showed us this yesterday, I was like, oh my gosh, I wish I had done it that way when I was in the classroom. I mean, I just thought that was brilliant. And Holly's templates. And you pick up all these little nuggets to build on what you are already doing. And I want to emphasize that we are already doing these things. And, you know, it's, it's kudos to all of you who are here because you not only are already doing a lot of these things, but you want to learn how to do more and you want to learn how to do it better. And that's what we're trying to do too. We're all learning how we can do it better for our kids. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Robert had a question about um, writing across the curriculum for students, um, for our multilingual learners to, to learn other subjects. Other subjects. Jody had a great webinar on this, uh, which is on our YouTube channel. It would be writing in the secondary classroom and she incorporated several content areas, um, math, I believe it was science and social studies. Yeah. Um, so we have a whole webinar on that, uh, Robert. It will be on our YouTube channel. I can uh, email you the link to that. Um, <clears throat> and definitely everybody check out our YouTube channel because we have um, some previous webinars posted there. There's one uh, on translanguaging uh, that was uh, done by uh, actually Holly's uh, co-author for that for the book that you uh, wrote with um, with Mandy. So definitely check that out. Um, you'll find a lot of great information there. And please do join us uh, next week for the Beyond Crises conversation. Um, that one, I, I like this week's conversation is definitely more about what am I doing in my classroom tomorrow to make sure I'm differentiating for my students. Next week is going to be uh, much more of a a big uh, a big picture like what, what to do about schooling and communities now that will affect, uh, positively impact schooling. So uh, we have a little bit of everything for you here at Saddleback. So we really encourage you to join our webinars when, whenever you can, whenever your uh, schedule allows. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. Don't forget to check out our new Go ELL Literacy Library. These are our content focused genres for middle school students, uh, accessible text, bright, beautiful pictures wrapped along in there is good, solid content area vocabulary. Have you had a first or second grade level book for your middle school uh, newcomers that incorporates words like nanotechnology? Well, we've got that for you. Uh, check it out. If you have any questions, um, send me an email. I'll schedule a call with you. I'll send you some samples, whatever you need. Uh, we've already talked a lot about our questions and comments, so don't forget to check us all out on social media. And thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer. Jennifer says, would that be core ELD? Uh, is that in reference to the, um, the Saddleback product? Because it's a supplemental library. Yes, ma'am. So that's a supplemental library that could be for English language development. Uh, I have teachers who are content area teachers who have the books in their classroom uh, just for free voluntary reading. So um, it, it really is quite a flexible uh, a flexible tool. So i um, happy to talk to you more about it. Just uh, send me an email and uh, we'll get that going. Yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. I got your email. I will schedule something with you. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you to our panel. This was amazing. Uh, if I haven't made that clear. Uh, and we hope all of you will join us next week. Have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Thank you.